Thank you all for coming to uh, the second talk about the uh, Dev Room today. Um, my name is Simon Bullis. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about um, how to measure the energy consumption of electronics. We're going to focus on um, smaller embedded systems, but everything I say will apply to measuring big devices, data centers, as well as it applies to small devices um, that might look forward to we have here. Um, so we're going to go through um, some fundamentals about what you need to know if you want to accurately measure um, energy consumption. And we're going to then show how you can build up um, things like what we've got on display at the workshop later on, uh, these homemade, um, rude um, energy efficient energy measurement devices. They're very cheap, very simple, you've just got to get to the design now. Okay. So as I'll do, um, I give credit to some of the slides here to James who's at the back of the room. He's going to he's going to give me a few graphs to include. And my presentation is running away with me already. No credits. Just 
to get straight the fundamentals here, we have energy, which is this physical quantity that measures the work available to do in the system, or the work that has been done in the system. Um, and that we can relate to the amount of computation that we can perform. So there's some efficiency of computation compared to an amount of energy put in. And if you say that was fixed, then if you've got more energy, you do more computation. <coughs> in electronics, um, the energy goes as heat, it heats up. That's how we lose the energy. So your battery turns into a portable electric heater, and that's what happens in your, in your portable devices. In winter time, I put my hands over on this side of my laptop with a nice warm feeling. And that's how we use it then. <coughs> so it's this physical quantity, and this is the limit of the mass we'll ever do today, but we'll have a little bit of mass with all. Um, so we've got energy E, and we've related to power. So power is this rate of change um, of energy, and so that can perform this integral. And this will turn out to be very useful later when we want to do energy measurement. Because what we can do is do power measurement from the integration, and then we get other kind of energy. <coughs> and both have these use cases. So I've shown you use cases where you need to limit energy, and also where you want to limit power. So that's why it's nice to be able to do that. <coughs> um, so to give you an idea about how this works in practice, what you actually do is you make a series of measurements. And so here is a scenario where you make power measurements over time. And what you gain are little thin bars. And there's a reason there's a gap between these bars, and that's that typically what you do is measurement, and there's a rest period when you calibrate the next measurement, and then you read that in. So you get gaps, <coughs> and you get instantaneous measures. So you don't get the full continuous knowledge. <coughs> but you get this idea. And so you get the idea here is the system is taking a bit of power and then takes less power. And it varies around it. You can convert that easily into energy if you have that set of measurements. You've got a set of power measurements now through time. You can say lots of things about the power consumption of the device. You can also then perform the integration process, which just measures the area under the curve. And now you have energy. So the volume under the curve, the area under the curve is the energy, and the measurements of power. So you get both at once. You just measure the power, and you have everything you need for energy, and more. <coughs> so energy is typically that ultimate metric that you want to measure, because you want to maximize your battery life. Um, and you can say some things that are nice. Um, if you know the amount of energy in your battery, you know the amount of energy your computation takes, you could say things like, well, I have 10 minutes more video time with energy. And that's kind of very useful to a, a user of a device. You can say, OK, well, you could be watching the film, but you won't get to the end and then you won't be able to make a phone call yet. So that's a choice you can actually make. Well, I don't care about phone call. I wonder what's the moment in my phone. <coughs> well, there's a big problem in computer science, which is that now we produce many applications that don't terminate. This is all the same for things like APC systems, where you have a big computation, it runs some amount of time, and it ends, <coughs> and you get results back. But most devices now, embedded devices, just run kind of forever or best ever in a loop. So sensors will never terminate. Um, little device can run my toaster, they never terminate. As long as it turns it's still turn, it's checking the button and it's been pressed. And so you can't actually measure the total energy of the application until it never finishes. And if you sat around to it, you need to use it. <coughs> so from this point of view, uh, it actually makes more sense in terms of to measure the power. Because then you get an idea of what is going on right now. And you can, of course, collect the power measurements and say, this is the range I care about. Do the integration of the curve I just did, and then um, you know the value system. <coughs> so the power is the thing we want to measure. So we had the option, we could have measured energy directly, but managing power turns out to be more generically useful. We can get energy, we can also get more information, and we can do a program to data on it. <coughs> and thankfully, it's easier to measure as well, so it's a win win situation here. Um, so that's what we do, that's what we choose to measure in a modern computing system, we'll, we'll measure the power it takes, and then do the maths later. <coughs> so what I'm going to do now is just go a quick bit into the fundamentals of where the energy is going, um, where the power is being dissipated, and uh, then go on to show how you can measure all this. <coughs> Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so we're going to just recall a little bit of kind of schoolboy physics. Um, We've got Joule's first law, which says the power of my system is the current of my system, I um, squared times the resistance of the system. Okay, so if I have current and resistance, I can measure power. And so that suffices to know if I can fix the resistance, which is the thing that I probably want to do in this scenario, then I only have to measure current. I measure one thing, I know one thing, and I can measure the power of the system. <coughs> the problem is 
But if you apply this to a computer, the resistance changes, the effect of resistance it changes depending on what's happening. So that R is no longer fixed. Um, so I can measure the current potentially, but the resistance I don't know. It'll be different whether I'm doing one instruction to another instruction to whether something is steamer and vice versa. I can't measure that. <coughs> Um, so one thing we're going to do is we're going to deploy Ohm's law to just rearrange a bunch of these terms and expression. And what you see here is basically I can rearrange these things any way I like. So I can look for voltage based on the current and the resistance of a system. I can um, look for resistance based on the over the current. And I can start substituting in some various terms of Joule's So if I combine the two laws together, I can get to this one here, which doesn't require me to know any resistance in my system. So that means that if I could measure the voltage and the current at the same time, then I'll be able to derive the power of that and to know the resistance. I do know the resistance, I'm going to measure it. And so this means actually I have a choice of how to do it. Because we can choose which is the easiest thing in a particular scenario to do with. Um, and we can get away with a measure one of those. <coughs> so we're going to come back to that when we show how to build the system. Um, but now we remember resistance capacitors um, and say these are the things fundamentally take um, the energy of computation. So I'm going to talk about an area called dynamic power dissipation here, which is the thing that isn't just I've got a slab of silicon and I'm warming it up by just having a voltage across it. That's another part of the influence of an operating circuit. But this is what happens when we do computation. We, we use these elements and uh, they dissipate. So here's my transistor, which is a modern MOSFET type transistor. The symbol on the left, and this is a very simplified diagram of what it looks like, what it used to look like maybe 20 years ago, but now it's, this will be jagged all over the place due to wonderful um, effect physics. <coughs> so we've got two different types of silicon, two different of silicon here. <coughs> and the idea is that this transistor will be able to be switched according to a voltage on the gate here, and if it's switched on, current passes between these two blocks of n-type silicon, and when it's switched off, current's not allowed to pass through that area, and this block is on that side, turns off. So this is a device you can turn on, you can turn off, based on the voltage from the gate. <coughs> and if you move the voltage from the gate, you will dissipate power. Why? Well, the first thing is, these essentially, you can think of, from one point of view, the two materials, they're separated together in the arm. So, whenever well, I've had a capacity. So this is a lovely parallel structure. That's how we, our industry has done so well, making these big, mass-produced, very flat devices. So I've got a big parallel structure, so what I've built myself is a parallel deck capacitor. <coughs> and it's about as long as a transistor. <coughs> so if I change the voltages at any point in the circuit, I actually start charging and discharging the crust pieces of that part of the circuit. So that means that I have to do some work. Let's get going. Um, I'm going to go to the next bit. Um, the other thing that happens here is that uh, we have resistance. It is a semiconductor. The word semi is in there. It's not a great conductor. It has a resistance, an appreciable resistance. <coughs> and so when I try and turn this thing on, and I pass current between the source and the drain, there's resistance in between. <coughs> and that resistance uh, is seen in the channel, mainly, and that contributes power. And the reason for the power is if we just look back at um, Ohm's law and Joule's law, um, we had a voltage across the resistor, that was the channel, and I had a resistance, and therefore it displaced power. And that power is squared. And this is one reason it's so good to treat computer chips. Because you treat computer chips, you can reduce the current to go through, and just the power comes from one that distance. So that's one effect. The other effect is the capacitance, which I think. Um, we can also look at the capacitor here, which is the in the transistor. And the capacitor is related to this equation here. This is the charge, which is essentially uh, the measure of energy, and the capacitor sign voltage. So whenever I change the voltage on my transistor, I change the charge in the capacitor structures, and that means that I change the power. And the energy here is just how often I charge and discharge it. So whenever I change the value on a transistor, I dissipate power. Whenever the transistor is on, I dissipate power. So there's a bunch of ways I can dissipate power. <coughs> so to give you an idea, here's a circuit. This is a full adder circuit, and you recognize it. 
Um, this adds together two more bit numbers and takes a fair amount to the basic and the basic circuit you'll find in the heart of any microprocessor. <coughs> so if red says that this is a high value, so this is a lot of one, the black one's got these zeros, this is the path of high voltage through my circuit. Okay, so it takes some paths between the inputs and the outputs, and it charges up a bunch of transistors in the various gates to which it's attached. So there you go, wang, I've taken some energy. We look at the output there, um, from that first tool gate, once I apply another high input, it changes from red to blue, blue here meaning a low voltage. So the voltage there changed, so it went from there to there, and as it changed, it swung the full voltage of my power supply. <coughs> Whatever that voltage is, probably one volt in one device. And so it charged and discharged faster by a volt. And so we now consume power by that. <coughs> so that's the reason that we use um, the energy. And there's a further effect which is down to, here's a converter, there's a single um, input, single output, and you get the opposite of what you put in. Um, if you build this device, you build it out of two transistors, and you have to arrange transistors in such a way that they are connected together. And when you change the value on this, and only really when you change the value, for a moment you turn on both of your transistors, at least partially. When that happens, you actually connect together your power supply momentarily. And that's a short circuit, and that dissipates a large amount of power, but for a very short amount of time. <coughs> so these are the reasons that um, we consume power for the measurement in the device. <coughs> so we can look at what influences the rate of power consumption. So I showed you that with the capacitance, in particular, the faster you change the values, you'll, the more you'll discharge and charge the capacitor. So if you've got faster clock, for example, you're going to change the values more often. You have faster changing the flipping of the values of wires, and in one second you would then do more charge discharging and you dissipate more power. Okay, any questions about this part? same time or resistance and current. Um, you can measure voltage is really easy, really, really easy. You buy a multimeter, probably euros, bad multimeter, and you can stick it on and you can measure the voltage to reasonable accuracy. You buy an expensive multimeter and get really good accuracy. You can buy an oscilloscope off the shelf and you can attach this and measure voltage with really good accuracy. Um, and you do all of these things, but it's fairly clunky and um, only partially automated. One, the strategy we use is to use a thing called the analog digital converter, which is built into a very large number of uh, off the shelf mm -hmm. devices in the embedded space, particularly. And we can make use of the to measure all of for us. So here's the, the high level block diagram. So the ADC, this is a block of a microprocessor, like this ARM based microprocessor we have on here. Um, I've not that one. But any video you can think of produces this FPGA sampling method. Um, so, you apply a voltage in to an input from the ADC, you get a reference from the ground, zero volts, <coughs> and it measures that voltage for you, and it gives you out a digital value. And it gives you some resolution, so 12 bits is quite common, resolution, and there you have your number. You now have measured voltage, you've got a digital representation, you can store it in a file, and it. <coughs> Typically these things work up to about 2.5 volts in an embedded device. Um, and so any volts which are doing that volts, you can just make it happen. Does it consume enough power to affect the measurement, or is it very efficient? It consumes a huge amount of power. Um, <laughs> I have a, a, a short slide about that later. But the ADC is actually one of the most power hungry components of any device um, that you'll find in the market. That's right. um, so what we do actually with the boards in the, in the workshop, the open book design, is we separate this out in separate boards. So you have separate boards, and you don't care about the power that board uses. Um, in order to it's a few minutes time, so it's not affecting the results as well. It's what they mean time over the on the vector. Yes, it thinks it's, it's virtually infinite. In fact, when it's turned, when it's measuring, it's infinite because it's disconnected internally. Mm -hmm. So they have a they have a sample followed by a conversion mechanism. So it is quite good. But yes, they're really powerful. You can see uh, there's a demo I think you might use later where you turn on the ADC and you can see the energy consumption of water. So this is a big disadvantage, but if you have a separate device, you then it's okay. It's a great question. Um, one of the problems that we encounter though 
is that um, these devices typically work with the device chip by volts, it seems to be okay, to be standard. Um, and often your power supplies may be higher voltages. Right? They may be 5 volts, 3 volts, 2 40 volts. Who knows? <coughs> Now, we can actually do some really simple electronics to bring down any higher voltage into that measurement plane. And this is the, the obvious thing to do. First thing we want to do, build this picture called a potential divider. It uses two resistors, and that allows us to drop a high range of voltages into a small amount. And it's determined by the equation that's up there, and V out is the voltage in times the ratio of resistors. So if we want to halve the voltage range, so we have 0 to 5 volts, we put two identical resistors in that, we'll get 0 to 2.5 volts out. And then we bring it into the range of the AC. So that's, that's fine, that's nice and easy. Um, and we will we'll do that when we need to. Uh, one of the problems with this design is you get this current flow through the resistors. You basically put a tap between the power supplies. And so uh, you have to account for that. So if this power supply here is supposed by a thing you care about, so the microprocessor you're measuring, then you're actually adding current onto its, onto its current. And that means you'll get a false result of the power consumption. It'll be off by the amount of current that goes through that. But thankfully, these are fixed resistors. You pick them you know, off the shelf, and they have values. So you can account for that, but you've just got to remember to adjust your results. Your process actually takes less current than you thought it did, because you're wasting current in your measurement. And this is the kind of thing that can affect results if you're not careful about it. You've got to remember to do it. <coughs> Nothing hard, but you don't do it, you'll get errors. <coughs> um, that is the one, that is the back of time. So what we do now is we want to measure current. Most commonly is we measure the voltage pair. And we use Ohm's law in order to transform the measurement of the current into a measurement of the voltage in a known resistance. The I squared R relationship. So we use Ohm's law. And um, what we'll do is we'll place a known resistance across a power supply. So if you look here, I've got a microprocessor supply here. There's the main power supply coming out of a battery. And I place a known resistance in that wire. <coughs> then what I do is I get a small voltage appears across the resistor based on how much current flows, and I can measure that. But it's a differential thing, so what I have to do is actually pass it through um, the thing that measures the difference in the voltages rather than absolute voltages before passing it onto the ADC. And this guy is called the differential amplifier. So it takes the voltage here at the top on the red line, minus the voltage on the blue line, and that's the output. <coughs> So you can you don't care whether this is five volts or three volts, it turns into a difference across the system. If you direct it proportional to the the um, current. the problem with this approach is that this resistor you have to put it into your power supply somewhere. And that's about how you spend a lot of our free time. But it's an evasive mechanism. If it's not already there, which probably will be, um, then you've got to insert. And you've got to pick the right kind of resistance value so that you don't stop circuit working. If you've got a really big resistor in the power supply, you just can't supply enough power to the microprocessor, and the microprocessor will fall over. If you have it too small, you get a very, very small voltage appearing across the resistor, it's very hard to measure. Tiny volt, 0.00 or something. <coughs> so you need to select carefully. Um, here's my guidelines. Um, well, most every microprocessor will deal with up to 0 0.05 volt change in the power supply without care. It's normally specified in the data sheet that that's an absolutely fine range to be in. <coughs> and so, um, if you want to maintain that as a maximum drop across your power supply, these resistors are used, which happen to be exactly the same as the ones on our measurement board, uh, uh, are given cover this range, which is the range of typical microprocessors. So, anything from microprocessor takes 
microwatts and then up to when it's been taken for lab. Some of the more powerful arm boards we have taken taken over that. And so this range of the resistor gives you the allowed voltage drop, but it is still very small. So what you're now doing is feeding this kind of voltage into the ADC converter in a microprocessor, which has a range of 0 to 2.5 volts. So you're using some tiny, tiny part of that range. What you want to do is to maximize the part of the range that you use, so that gives you more resolution, gives you more um, points inside the range that you can discriminate. So what we do is we actually amplify in the analog domain the voltages that we see. So we don't just create that differential voltage, we also amplify it at the same time. And the thing we do is we amplify by a factor of 50, and that then scales up 0.05 volts into 2.5 volts. So we can then cover the exact range that the ADC is sensitive to. Um, fully. <coughs> and that makes it much more useful. So your question then is how do you build that, that amplifier, differential amplifier? Well, that's the stuff of kind of e electronics engineering students the world over in their first year. Um, you can use this device called an operational amplifier. It's well known, well tested. Um, it's very easily available off the shelf, and you build exactly this circuit. So you have three connections on the device, so a differential input, so an output, and then what you do is you add in this thing called feedback, which gives you, um, again, an amplification capability. And you can set these resistors, so 50 times gain, I set this one here to um, 50,000 ohms, and this one to 1,000 ohms, <coughs> And you can find that the table is absolutely nothing like that. And then what we do is just take that trip resistance part of that power supply. The downside to this is when I started just thinking, well, should I build this circuit since we make boards based on it? Um, you find out weird things. Like the fact you've got four resistors here adds more cost to the assembly of your, of your measurement than it does to buy the operating amplifier. Um, and that's because assembly, the robot has to now go and go to four more places and got four more resistors. And We've got two different values and the natural cost of making it. So if you wanted to mass produce this, there's a way forward to that attractive part. <coughs> and it's uh, annoying, breaks on layout, doesn't look so pretty, all sorts of things. Um, so we can actually buy off the shelf dedicated current sense amplifiers. They're designed exactly for this application across the processing system. And they have fixed um, amplification. And there is indeed one that gives 50 times amplification. Uh, we use one to maxim. They produce a range of these devices with different calibratable ranges um, and one or four different inputs, different inputs. So you can measure it to four power supplies at once and that's what I said our boards do. <coughs> and you do all of this and it's a relatively expensive chip but it's nice and The devices have this fundamental limit called bandwidth, which says what is the fastest that I can amplify? What's the fastest signal that I can amplify? And these devices actually have very low bandwidth and that's because they amplify so high. Times. Um, and they go up to about 2 megahertz. And what that means is that you can't measure accurately a signal that's really passing a million times a second. You use these devices, there's no point in measuring faster than that because they don't have a bandwidth of power and what's necessary. There's no point in there? There's well, there's not quite no point, there's little points in that because the what you've done is you've created a system where, where go back to this diagram. So you've got a system here. If this can measure very, very quickly, you've introduced in the middle a weak link. Okay. Yeah. So this kind of passes all of the information from the resistor into the ABC because it has this limit. And so the ABC can go faster and faster faster, but there's no more information to be got. Yes. Analog, yeah. so it's, a, it's a function of the transistors that are built into that device. Um, if you drop the amount of amplification, you can push that up. And this is a trade off. There's a fixed trade off between how much you want to multiply the voltage of your signal and how quickly you can do that. And so if you drop that down, and that's why there's a range here, because there's a range of amplification between 20 and 100 times. And if you amplify in 20 times, you get 2 megahertz. If you amplify 100 times, you get 3 megahertz. So you have to choose that. So you choose where you lose information in the ABC or mm -hmm. <coughs> um, So then for this boundary, uh, let's say we have some uh, circuit that we are to pass the higher frequency. Uh, yeah. And we lose some information or that we lose. You'll lose, yes, absolutely, you'll lose that information. Is that uh, 
So there's a really good question about what information is in this one. Um, one of the things that happens when you, when you pass a benefit is it smooths the signal, kind of fundamentally smooths the signal. So the total, if you were to take an infinite number of samples of the output, you'll get the same representation of the total energy. But what you don't know is the shape of the curve. So you don't know when it went up and when it went down, but you will see the total reduced. So you lose in the ability to say, well, it was that part of the loop that took a lot of power. Or it was that part. You'll just say, my program took this much. And that will still be an accurate answer. You can't tell where in time. It, it, will, measure, uh, it will measure, the power readings will be different, but the integral the total energy will be the same. So your energy figure is still accurate, but you, your, your when it happened is less accurate. And that's something to be really aware of. Uh, that also means that you can do maths, you can do statistical correlations over repeating measurements to try and gain more information, because the total is always the same. <coughs> but that's, that's an annoying thing, it's worth it when. You can buy a more expensive device but to push away the limitation and build a more expensive circuit. You can always do this, uh, almost always do it. <coughs> And the other thing the problem is you have with this device is the, the analog digital converter part um, has a built-in error because what you're doing is you're taking a continuous quantity, which is voltage, and you're producing a binary value, which has a fixed number of digits. And so you, you can have error, um, and that's almost always half of a bit. So when you take a, a value out of measurement, you should always basically discard the least bit, or at least average it over the multiple cycle. Because that will essentially randomly flip, just depending on exactly how your NEC operates. <coughs> There's a minimum conversion time, so the ABC puts a speed limit in the provision, and that means you can't pass, make it faster than the ABCs. Um, they themselves dissipate power, so there was a question earlier about, about that. That gives bias in the sample, you've got to remember to take that off. And uh, the final one, they generate quite a large amount of data, even a small, quite slow ABC. Uh, excuse me, how do we have to interpret this decision? Half an LSD, so we significant. Bit, sorry, bit, bit, bit. Yeah. bit. Listen to bit. So you've got 12 bit representation, the bottom yeah. bit is 0 or 1 plus or minus 0 0.5. Yeah, I know, no, because it's the actual mean. You're right, yeah. it's a, sorry, yes, at least some bit. I don't want half right to know. Give you an idea, if you've got a device like this going at a million samples a second, you generate 12 bits, you have your sample, sample the rest of the program data, and you then can max out a USB one. So one of the problems we have with this device is that embedded devices are <coughs> be not great at doing USB, so getting the data off here, even though it does USB 2, it can't max out USB 2, we don't have the ability to get off all the data that we make um, from our devices, even though we only measure these kinds of So that's well worth remembering. So what you can do is you pre-process data, you put a processor lying around, we do that as well. Um, but you do want to say, okay, do I have an idea what's important information? Do I need every sample? Helps you design your software. <coughs> Any more questions? <coughs> do you need to be concerned about the tolerances on the shunt resistance? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So the, the power consumption measurement you get is directly correlated to the resistance, the very portion of the resistance. So if the resistance changes, then uh, always has a tolerance error then your measurement is out by that as well. And you can, of course, cut, you can measure the resistance in, in the scope or in a multimeter, so you can have it. Um, for this reason, again, <coughs> shame to put, in the open source uh, design, we specify some very tight tolerance resistance, 0.5% resistance, so to minimize any differences. Um, so in the true resistance, some of them are 0.1% What about the What about, hmm? about non-linearity of the uh, hmm. ABC? You take any of that as well? Uh, that, yeah, that, that will be specified in the data sheet um, where, where that happens. Typically, they are internally calculated to produce a linear output um, when you get the binary representation. But the, these kind of things depend on the ADC that you use, and you have to read the data sheet. It's always a caveat. So you normally get a, a, a linear a binary representation, even if there's not a linear response to the itself. <coughs> okay, so we've got some other limitations. So. Uh, not, everything's not great, right? Um, one of the problems was we had to connect in this sugar resistor into our devices. Um, which means we either need a board that has one, or we have to do some desoldering followed by some soldering. So what we have to do is remove one component to make space for soldering some wires, and then add in whatever you took off, plus your sugar resistor. 
to give you an idea what these kind of things look like, this is a board we have back in our lab. This is a power supply, it's a one volt power supply. We've got a chip here, it's a power supply chip. Capacitors, this is a switch mode power supply, it's got a filter in here. Here's the little chunk resistor in this. Uh, Magnified this quite a lot, so it's a really tiny device. But here's a board and it's got little, two little probe points and you can put you know, a multimeter in here or you can put the, uh, the circuit I've just shown you across these two sockets and then you will get the <coughs> And so that's nice. And uh, the fact that most devices don't have that, so the Beagle, Beagle um, White doesn't have it, so what you have to do is dab hand the soldering, and I think you see this one on the stand if you want to. And in here there was some power supply components that have been removed, replaced by a bunch of wires and a bunch of glue, and then everything is connected in uh, externally. <coughs> uh, so if you want to do that kind of modification, you need to know which components to take off. Because some of you take it off, it's going to break, some of you take it off, it won't break and you need to know where to connect that into. Um, and there's two popular types of power supply, and they have different components. <coughs> um, on small, cheap devices, you typically find this thing called a linear power supply. Um, it's good because it's very cheap, um, and very small, but it's pretty inefficient, so it's not used for large devices and get too hot. Um, and those devices use things for switch mode power supplies, that's the kind of power supply you've got for your laptop, and um, it's much more efficient. Uh, these things here, depending on what you put in, might be as bad as 20%, 30% efficient. These ones here are normally 98 plus percent efficient. <coughs> so let's look at the linear one first, simple the two. Um, what it does is it says, okay, I've got an input voltage and I've got an output voltage, that's a voltage for the microprocessor, and I'm going to change the difference by just wasting the energy. Okay, so you put in five volts, you've got one volt, it just wastes four volts with it. It's, uh, and it's really a, a big kind of thing. So there's a representation, it's transistor, it changes value depending on the input voltage you put in there. Um, it's a regulator, and you get out whatever you bought on the package. The package normally specifies 5 volt output, 1 volt output, whatever you get. <coughs> so you get a voltage out here, 5 volts goes in, 1 volt might come out, and then you add in this sugar resistor for your measurement. Well, you drop a little voltage across that, maybe 0.05 volts, <coughs> and that means your processor actually now sees 0.95 volts instead of the 1 volt it was expecting. Processes always still work, but you're not running it at the same condition that you were thought you were. You thought you were measuring it for a one volt performance. And as Jeremy mentioned in the previous talk, if you drop the voltage, you become more efficient. So you've actually helped you know, the energy of the system by doing the measurement. Again, you've disturbed the system. <coughs> um, now, with switch mode power supplies, we can actually get away from that. <coughs> because the regulator has this you know, feedback, it can measure the output, and it just for it. <coughs> and so there's a massively simplified uh, diagram of a, a switch mode power supply. Um, but the switch mode power supply is made by having a switch, a transistor, in series with an inductor, and this switch goes up and down really, really quickly um, to provide power this way, which is then stored temporarily in the inductor. And it looks at the output and says, do I need to connect the power supply again? Do I need to connect it? And if the voltage is too low, connect the power supply, if it's too high, it <coughs> And so this thing goes up and down, comes and down times a second, and there's a measurement point where feedback comes in to decide whether to close the switch. <coughs> so you've got the shift resistor in. As long as you put the shift resistor before the feedback, and it could be in either order with the inductor, and it could be order with the switch, then you will get feedback that ensures that the voltage across there is adjusted for automatically. So what that would look like in the same example, his five volts goes in, oh gosh, my end button and my um, page down button. It's 5 volts in, you'll get 5 1 volt out if it's a 1 volt power supply. And the reason is because, it's, because the power supply will increment on the other side of the shunt system and automatically it will adjust it. So the shunt system will be there, that would be 1 volt. Since it's there, it notices that the voltage changes across it. So now you can bring your processor at one volt, which is potentially what So it's better from the point of view of being able to make a more accurate measurement for the conditions that you want. <coughs> and then my last thing on this really is how fast can we do this? So we talked a little bit about the amplifier, but there's another part of my system. What's our power supply and a resistor and a capacitor, which is at least the input to my um, processor, but normally also another capacitor to make a nice stable power supply. What I've built is this thing called an RC charging circuit. And they're well known because they take time to charge in the down. And they've got this wonderfully simple relationship, which is the amount of time taken to change the voltage 
on that passage proposed by Albert um, is related to our time scene. <coughs> and what that means is at the at the point where you're coming out past the line, the voltage can only change so quickly. And it changes the maximum of that speed. And so that limits the rate at which the power supply voltage will change, you'll see a change there. Regardless of if the microprocessor suddenly gets to get a power supply and say, I want infinite, I want infinite current now, you won't see that for a some time on your measure. You will see it eventually, but you won't see it straight away. And that means that you can then push through values. This is a common linear power supply. If you push through these values, what actually happens is there's a limit to the physics of the, <coughs> the connection. Not, not, no longer the amplification. And it turns out that you buy that very popular off the shelf part of the regulated 5 volt power supply, you will never see a response more than 1.5 volt per minute. So that means in the signal you wanted to measure, there wasn't anything more interesting than running that speed that you can see. So even if you had a 500 megahertz processor, you won't be able to see its power supply changing to 500 megahertz because of the damping that the power supply is <coughs> So this actually means, we've got this other thing on the so it means you need to. We measure the point measuring passing through megahertz in this scenario, which you won't see, there's no information available. <coughs> so that's worth bearing in mind, because otherwise you think, well, I just buy a very expensive oscilloscope and I can measure anything I like. You actually can't think, you would never be able to measure it at 5 megahertz. <coughs> um, what that means for your output, though, is that if you say, okay, here is my processor, running 5 megahertz, running instructions, with that kind of power supply, you'll never be able to resolve closer together than a block of three different constructors when you want. So you won't be able to say that app that takes my energy. You'll be able to say that block of three different constructors. No, let's go and have a look at it. And this means. <coughs> so if you want for Benny, you've got to re-engineer the entire power supply to the microprocessor for the package. <coughs> and so whilst this works for a slow device, so I had a slow device, I can say this is It's running at one megahertz. I can do that. Five minutes on there. So again, graphically, you'll never get out this kind of level of resolution of saying, it's this line of my assembly code that took the power. <coughs> but you might be able to say, well, maybe it's that block of code. And maybe it's got that kind of size. So that's what we're looking at with these kind of measurement devices. And I have, I think, one minute left to just show you what these designs look like when you look at these If you want to play more with these designs, you have a workshop session, you can come and take them home. <coughs> um, so we've got this device, and it's open source design, here's the link, you can download it, uh, we use open source CAD software, and you can download the design of the CAD software, generate files and send them out. Uh, four channels, six megs per second, so it would, do, it would measure accurately everything we've seen today, full bit resolution, um, and this is what it looks like, if you zoom in, this is my hand, we've got, this is the amplifier in the middle, the biggest part of the device, we've got a big selection of different chip resistors that you can insert by connecting to the chip. So you have to do some soldering. All you have to do is connect your power supplies into some pins here. So you have to break the power supply trace on your board, take two wires out, and push them into here, and here and here, and then that's it. <coughs> then you set some jumpers, little nice red jumpers we've got, um, and this will then do all the work that is designed, you know, be carefully controlled. This thing plugs into um, and a cheap arm evaluation board. Here, that's what nine euro board. You can buy it to shelf from RAS, Farnell, any of your favourite companies, um, and that then collects the data and has the ABC inside. I think I'll leave the next to my last slide. Um, this is what comes out. And you play again, this in the workshop. Um, there's, we have software that connects the USB and you can visualise the output of that measurement device on a PC, a laptop, and here we've got the current measurement going through one probe point, voltage measurement. And the power. And what you can see here is we weren't doing anything on the target processor, and then we do things. It shoots up and then start flipping around. And that's the block trace. So I think with that, I'll just uh, skip to the end and say <coughs> you know, it's very useful to be able to do this because now you can say things like I can say a block of 300 codes on a 5 megahertz processor. Here's my block. That's the block that is taking energy. Let's go and engine re engineer that. But a slow processor, I'd say five minutes. <coughs> We've got the open source design, please download it, take a free kit away today. Uh, you may need to do a little soldering at the level of just breaking a track, soldering one wire, soldering another wire, and then you can put it into our own design. So it's as simple as possible. We've got hands-on workshops starting at 12. So with that, I'll leave you with the time and then you can tell. Yeah, so you put a, a tiny 
me also for another thing. Um, on the board that measures the, the voltage, the ABC board, there's a bunch of little pins here. If you attach a wire on here to any I.O. output of the voltage that you're measuring, and directly before you work, you just say change that again. Well, it doesn't synchronize the time. There's no program. You're, you're programming out one line at the start and said just toggle it. Yeah. There's, there's big differences in that depending on, because CPU is one CPU that has a bunch of different uh, power management states it can be, and it can be running slow. It can be completely used if it's running slower than it could be, but it's completely utilized. Or it can be running max out and completely utilized. And it'll have very different power characteristics. Yes, that also has an effect. So I don't know what's up on the description of it. I'm sure James will be covering that. Yes, that um, we're, run, we're starting to run out of time, so great for all the questions. We're going to hand up the next talk. We'll If you've got more questions, do come along to the workshop and have the whole team here. Uh,